Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me welcome you to the uh, Regional Partnership Series of webinars. Uh, these webinars are uh, focused on natural resources issues defined pretty broadly. And each time we host one of these, sorry about that. Please mute. Uh, I'm just going to mute all until we otherwise know. Uh, each of these webinars is intended to uh, feature a university partner, and today we'll have Don Wise in his role as the uh, one of the key uh, founders and uh, collaborators on the Forever Green Agricultural Initiative. And our second presenter will be Darren Mayers from uh, Crow Wing County Soil and Water Conservation District. And uh, sorry about the uh, stormwater protection for an important uh, trout stream and deep water uh, lake in that area. Uh, I'm standing in today for Rose Clark. Uh, Rose has become very efficient at running these webinars, and I'm feeling a little less efficient. But please uh, bear with us, and let me uh, turn now uh, turn the presentation over to Don Wise. Don, I think you'll need to unmute your own microphone if it isn't already. Uh, Don has been a longtime friend of the Regional Partnership Program, and we're really happy to uh, have you uh, sharing this information on the webinar today. I will mute. Yeah, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, again, Don Wise uh, here. I operate off of the uh, St. Paul campus um, at the University of, uh, of Minnesota. And what I'd like to chat with you uh, about uh, today is the Forever Green Initiative. Uh, this program has been under development for the, uh, the last uh, 20 years, and we're now moving to a position where uh, we are uh, developing uh, new crops uh, that are being, uh, for the first time, incorporated on the landscape for, for uh, commercial use. I represent a, de a department that brought you corn, soybeans, wheat, and barley, and really what we're talking about now is bringing you the next generation of crops. And just to give you the bottom line of what Forever Green is all about, it's basically the next generation of crops that are highly productive, but also produce ecosystem services. So that's the the base of uh, of the of the story today. Historically, the Midwestern landscape and the agricultural landscape was quite diverse, and most of you all know why, because crops and, and corn were being uh, uh, produced on the landscape at the, at, the same, at the same time. But over the years, those two got separated, where we now have grain farms, and then we have uh, feedlot operations, which has changed the uh, landscape dramatically. So that's really how the landscape changed. Just to give you a fast flashback to the 40s, the Midwestern landscape was really made up of a diverse set of crops. And again, why was it a diverse set? It was basically feed for livestock that uh, were positioned in all farms across the region. And the change to a monoculture system happened really, really fast. By the mid 70s, uh, basically, as he would travel across the Midwest, it would be basically a, a two-crop system, in some areas even a, a one-crop system, grain being produced and then shipped to the feedlots uh, for, uh, for, for meat, meat production. And basically, the landscape today is, as you travel across the region, two or three crops, and in most cases, just two, and they're all summer annuals. And what does that mean? Basically meaning that the fall is brown as it is now, and the spring is also brown. Very little li uh, living cover on the landscape to hold the soil uh, and to keep the nutrients uh, in, uh, in, 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 in place. So the two big drivers of the system today has been uh, livestock feed. As and all of you know, the other major driver of what's on the landscape today, especially corn, uh, is the uh, ethanol that's being produced from, from the corn. So meat production, ethanol production, 
are key players in, in what we see on the landscape across uh, most all of the, of the, of the Midwest. Uh, David Foley, uh, John, I'm see, John Foley uh, produced this document uh, in science a number of years ago that basically looked at what ecosystem services are being produced by various landscape designs. The natural system was very efficient in producing ecosystem services, but didn't produce much food. But we moved our agricultural systems to the other extreme. Basically, the agricultural systems of today produce food or feed, but very few or no ecosystem services. So as I talk about the Forever Green Initiative, we're really talking about the design of a new agricultural system, new components of an agricultural system that remains as productive or even more productive than what we have today, and at the same time produces ecosystem services. And I argue that that is the grand challenge for agriculture uh, for, uh, uh, for, for the future. We all know the consequences of what we have. I hate showing these slides. We show them over and over and over again, but we don't make much progress in dealing with the problem. The Forever Green Initiative is designed, is designed to develop real new solutions to, uh, to, these, to these problems. Uh, local problems uh, down the river issues, whether it's in the Gulf of Mexico or Lake Winnipeg, uh, in Canada, they're all being influenced by our agriculture, uh, uh, our agriculture systems. We've known these things for a long time, and they all make you stop and think. It's so obvious, but we haven't made much progress in really investing in uh, new long-term uh, uh, solutions. This is a set of slides that I use to really lay it out visually. When you look across, this is a set of slides that show chlorophyll levels on the landscape over time. Starting here in April uh, through, uh, through May, you can really see Minnesota, can't you? Illinois, Indiana, brown soil, no living plants on that landscape through, in this case, through May 17th. And that continues all the way through May 31st and into the middle part of June. So that very long open brown period in the spring. And then we all know, if you look across the landscape uh, today, it's brown again, isn't it? So we only have really intense uh, uh, plants on the landscape in our current agriculture system from about June 15th to September 15th, three months three months with active roots in the soil, holding the nutrients there, holding the soil there, and that's what I always say. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> and there are a lot of things that can go wrong, right? Uh, 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 very low water use efficiency, nutrient leaching, soil erosion, uh, and as we all know, other ecosystem services are not being provided for bees and for uh, natural predators, so it's a system that does not produce many ecosystem uh, uh, ecosystem services. And we all know when this uh, uh, soil is brown, it's a very intense rainfall period in the Midwest. From Giles Randall's work at Wasika, we know this is also when we have the greatest tile line flow. So it shouldn't be any surprise that nitrate nitrogen is leaving that system because you don't have the roots, the crop uh, roots there to pick up and hold that nitrogen, let alone use that water that's being released into the, into, into the system. So this is a very important slide for me. It goes back to the work at Guile and a number of us were doing uh, uh, back in the, in, the, in the 90s that basically showed in, in these tie line systems, no matter what you have in terms of the best management practices possible, you're still moving up to 80 pounds of nitrate nitrogen out of the corn and soybean rotation. However, in the same experiment, when you compared that nitrogen loss to alfalfa or a mixture of grasses, the loss dropped, drops to two. What I like to say about the Forever Green Initiative is this, we're about two. 
how do you create agriculture systems that, that dramatically reduce the amount of nitrogen that's being lost in the system and creating an opportunity for more efficient use of the water rather than releasing it into the rivers and streams causing erosion, so uh, uh, riverbank erosion and sedimentation in our rivers and, uh, and, and streams. We all know uh, nitrogen loss. A lot of people, we all like to talk about in many cases from the standpoint of, of water contamination, well water contamination, but we also know as we talk about the loss of nitrogen uh, in the Red River, in the Mississippi River, we're losing about 250 million pounds of nitrogen per year. And in many cases, this is worth 50 cents a pound. So it's not only pollution, but it's also uh, a loss of, uh, of, of, of money as well for our farmers. And it's well laid out now where this nitrogen is coming from. A large portion of it is coming from our highly disturbed agricultural uh, 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 systems. Now looking to the future, there's been a number of reports that are coming out of the Department of Agriculture, Pollution Control, that as they look to the future, if we're trying to meet a, a goal of a 40% reduction in nitrogen loading, basically what the models say is we cannot meet that goal unless we have new plant material on the landscape. And again, the Forever Green Initiative is the plant development program at the University of Minnesota that's in a position to develop these new crops that will fit on the landscape uh, for, for, for the future. One other thing I haven't mentioned yet. This isn't the first time we've talked about getting new sets of plants in the landscape, is it? We've talked about cover crops. We've talked a while across a wide range of, of things that we would desire. I've been at the University of Minnesota for 42 years. This is my third cycle of effort on the development of cover crops on the use of cover crops and agricultural systems in the, in the Midwest. There have been a few farmers that have used them over time, but it's not on a very large number of acres. Why? Why is that? Why is that? I would argue that there's no economic incentive to make that happen. In other words, putting a cover crop in the system increases cost and in some cases increases the risk. The Forever Green Initiative is trying to discover ways of reducing that risk by the placement of new plant materials on the landscape that make it economically viable for farmers to put a new set of plants on the landscape. So we're talking about new enterprise development based on the development of these uh, new crops that I'll describe to you here in a, in a, in a, in a, few, in a few minutes. So it comes down to this issue. We desire a broad array of crops on the landscape. The question is, how do you get there? We believe that we're in a unique situation in time. In the development of a series of new crops. A lot of you have been watching the development of the genomic technologies we all remember back when, when the, uh, we were putting billions of dollars into sequencing the genome for humans. And I did say billions. What has happened over the last 10 years is the cost of doing that type of research has dropped from a billion dollars to sequence a genome to $25 that level reduction. It now opens up the possibility of sequencing the genome for all of these new crops in support of breeding programs to develop and to domesticate a whole set of new plants for agricultural uh, use. And this is not genetic engineering. This is basically using the, the map uh, the genomic map to do a better job of classical breeding. Our scientists now think 
that using this technology, we should be able to domesticate a crop from scratch in 15 years rather than 150 years or more. So it's a new set of possibilities that we have now that never existed um, in, the, in, in the past. So within the Forever Green Initiative, we are focusing on two types of plants. We're first focusing on perennial grains. The second area of investment is in winter annuals. Some of you have probably heard about the work that's going on here at the Land Institute on intermediate wheatgrass or Kernza. This is the first perennial grain. It's now in production in Rosso, Minnesota, um, in, on contract with the Patagonia Provisions. And I guess it was just uh, late last week that Patagonia Provisions put their new ale, their new beer, uh, out for sale on the West Coast. Uh, called Long, Long Root Ale. And the seed for that uh, ale came from Rosso, Minnesota. Uh, so you can see that it, it's no longer just a pipe dream. We are now taking uh, grain from the intermediate wheatgrass, the Kernza, producing it here in Minnesota, and products are being developed from it. That is what needs to happen with a wide range of these new crops. Uh, so there's an economic pull to change the landscape. And without that, I'm convinced that it will be very difficult for us to uh, get new crops on the landscape without that, economic, with, without that economic pull. So as I described, it's a new environment. We have new genetic technologies that will allow, allow for rapid uh, development of uh, this new germplasm, but at the same time, we still have to go in and develop the new economic practices for each of these crops. And then the key part where I spend a lot of my time now is on the commercialization of of uh, the, the commercialization of products from uh, from these new new crops, and then developing the supply chain. Uh, to meet the needs of the of the end users, and I'll say a little bit more of that about that here in a uh, in a couple of minutes. But just to give you an idea of how comprehensive this program is, we're not talking just about Kernza. We're talking about a full array of uh, of perennial crops that are currently under development. So within this list of perennial crops, it ranges from the one that is probably the most advanced, that would be Kernza. We're also working on our perennial sunflower. That program has been in place for almost 15 years. We're working on a wide range of uh, polycultures and mixtures uh, for uh, a wide range of uses, including natural products. There our partner is, in terms of end use, is Estee Lauder and the Aveda Corporation. We have isolated bioactive compounds, high-value compounds, from native plants that are now going to be used uh, at Estee Lauder and the Aveda Corporation as preservatives, for example, in hair, hair care products all the way through to lipstick. So this is a new market from a set of plants that can produce ecosystem services but have value in the marketplace, uh, giving uh, economic possibilities for farmers to produce those new and those new uh, uh, new crops. The other big area is the perennial flax. Perennial flax is native to North America. It has exactly the same oil complex as annual flax. Um, so that is moving into a program. Uh, General Mills uh, is very excited about incorporating perennial uh, flax seed into, into their food products. Another big area are these uh, legumes. Curra clover is a long-lived uh, legume that's being used as a continuous living cover for the corn and soybean rotation. And that's the other point I would like to point out. Within this set of plants, we're not talking about necessarily always displacing corn and, corn and soybeans. We're talking about how these new crops can be incorporated within the framework of corn and soybean production. But in the case of Kernza, for example, that would displace corn and soybeans. And 
as you would look at a landscape, we would look for ways of positioning uh, that crop on the landscape uh, to maximize ecosystem services at a landscape uh, landscape level. Our newest perennial that we're working with is silphium. It's a native plant, um, and all, most all of you know that uh, sunflowers, perennial sunflowers, are native to North America. Silphium is a cousin uh, to helianthus, the sunflower. It's also a potential new oil seed crop. We now have a big program in partnership with a number of institutions across the United States from here to, to Texas to develop silphium as a next uh, a new generation uh, oil seed crop. What's unique about it, it is extremely, it is extremely drought tolerant. This could very well be the oil seed crop of the a sand plain in central Minnesota. Uh, whereby it would be able to protect <laughs> that shallow groundwater aquifer uh, and then at the same time produce an economically viable crop in that uh, 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 droughty uh, soil environment in, in, in central Minnesota. The winter annuals, this is another major component of the program. In other words, we're looking at the development of winter annuals that could be seeded now in the fall that would provide uh, uh, cover um, over the fall period and then uh, grow early in the spring and be harvested by the first week in June, which allows it to, to be used as a relay crop or a rotation crop in the corn and soybean rotation. In other words, filling that brown period in the corn and soybean rotation, as well as other uh, summer annual uh, uh, crop rotations that would fit the uh, that would fit Minnesota. So pennycress and camelina are the two the most advanced uh, winter annuals that we have, and these are also being developed in partnership with PepsiCo and General Mills. Remember this whole idea that this will never happen unless there is an end use. So our primary uh, partners here uh, on the two winter annual uh, oilseed crops, pennycress and camelina, is PepsiCo and General Mills. General Mills is very interested in the camelina, the meal, the fiber, the protein, as well as the oil for incorporation into a wide range of, uh, of food products uh, uh, that they currently have on the shelves. Uh, the pennycress. Uh, is not a food grade oil at this stage. PepsiCo is interested in it, taking it as a uh, oil that could be used to produce polymers for packaging. So again, it's a wide range of opportunities for these oils from food use uh, to, uh, uh, to in, uh, more industrial uses. And just to mention winter barley, our winter bar our barley program led by Dr. Smith has been uh, a very active barley program in the United States. They're now converting that program to a winter uh, barley program to produce ecosystem services, but also to produce a grain uh, that would have malting, uh, uh, malting uh, quality as, as, as well. I'll stop there and take the next couple of minutes just to give you uh, a, a couple of, of, of examples. So pennycress, just to give you an idea. So the idea is it's going to fit into an enterprise. It's going to have an in use. For example, the oil uh, uh, with, with, with PepsiCo that I just described and have it fit in as a double or relay crop with corn and soybeans or other summer, summer annuals. Why is it exciting? It's winter hardy. <laughs> it, over, it will overwinter here in Minnesota. It has very early uh, uh, seed maturity, has high oil content, and, and it's a, a plant that it's a diploid. It's e easy to work with genetically. This is how it will fit. We are now seeding it in the fields as we speak. Going into corn, it will establish in the fall. It will overwinter. And if you look at the bottom picture there, that's what it would look like in mid-May. It's mature the first week in June. We would then follow with soybeans and it would go through that cycle. That would be the double crop. Here's the relay crop. The only difference is 
that we would come in and plant soybeans no-till in it in, in, in picture four. That is planting soybeans no-till into the pentacrest in the first week of, of May. We would then harvest the pentacrest over top of the soybeans. And this gives you the, the, uh, the two crop uh, system. And here's an, uh, a, a close up of what I just showed you earlier, showing how it's harvested over top of the, uh, of the soybeans and how it's then planted, having been planted directly no tail into, into the soybean. This is the type of yields that we're getting. On the far uh, uh, left, you see soybean yields full season without a cover crop, yielding 50 bushel. And I won't go through the whole sequence, but just go over to the third uh, uh, part of the, uh, the third column, Pentecrest sequential. This is, the, this is the idea, and these are the type of results that we're getting. The soybean yields are not going down in the system, plus we're producing an additional uh, oilseed uh, crop, in this case, uh, in that column, uh, uh, the, the Pentecrest. So going from a 50 bushel yield per acre up to something that is in the range of 90 to 95 bushel of seed uh, per acre. Key is, what's the value of the Pentecrest seed? How much is PepsiCo going to be willing to pay the farmers to produce that seed? So that is the commercialization that's going on now. But the point is, there is the interest all the way through the system, including the, the, uh, the end users like PepsiCo. And in the case of Cameline, it's the same idea. There, the end user would be, uh, would be General Mills. I don't know whether you can see this, but this is the idea that these new cover crops, the winter annuals, give you the same reduction in, in uh, uh, nitrate leaching as of the gold standard winter rye. Winter rye doesn't give you economic value. These two do. So it has economic value as well as producing those eco ecosystem services. I want to show you one more. So that would be the winter annual group. And here is the intermediate wheat grass as we're getting close to running out of time. Uh, here's intermediate wheat grass. The reason we're interested, look at the long, deep roots to hold the soil in place, use water, and to fix carbon uh, sequence. Uh, fixed carbon in, uh, in the soil profile. This is what our breeding program looks like on the St. Paul campus. Each one of those is a different uh, 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 genetic uh, line, and this would be the basis of the, of the breeding program. What are we trying to do? Increase seed size, maintain the, the biomass, maintain disease resistance, and then working with General Mills and the Food Science Group to move the product into the, into the marketplace. So basically what we're doing here is the direct domestication of a wild species. Basically selecting within the species, not even making uh, broad crosses, but just breeding within the species to domesticate it as a perennial grain crop. So this is, again, what the breeding program would look like, making the process and evaluating the various lines. We made great progress already in increasing seed size. Um, uh, this is what the new varieties look like out at, uh, at Becker. The University of Minnesota will re be releasing five new varieties of Kernza uh, next year. So the other big part of the program is the food science part. Nothing, none of this is of value unless there's an end use. So in our food science group, we look at uh, basic amino acid composition, uh, starts functionality to produce various products. Uh, we look at flavors uh, in, the, in the grain, selecting for various flavor types. We look at the production of various food products. And it is catching on across the country, even as a bread. The 50-50 mixture of wheat and, uh, and, and, and uh, Kernza uh, flour produces a bread that is really catching on across the country, let alone uh, the work that's being done by General Mills to incorporate the flour into a wide range of existing, uh, uh, existing products. 
So I will stop there. And uh, if any of you have any questions, um, you can certainly send them to me today. Um, uh, or you can certainly get in contact me uh, in, in person over the phone or email, and would be very happy to uh, uh, to, to deal with some of these uh, uh, exciting opportunities with you. Yeah, thank you, Donna. And if uh, you have a quick question now, you can enter it in the chat box. Uh, we do have one question right now. It says, "Where did the name Kernza come from?" Well, uh, the other, the primary partner with us on this, and you guys, I'm sure, are, are well aware of the Land Institute. Lee DeHaan is a graduate student of mine that now uh, works as a breeder at the Land Institute, and uh, our our work is in partnership with them. It was, in fact, the Land Institute that came up with the name. So there is a connection to the concept of Kansas, Kansas grain. And, and that is the back the backbone of, uh, of of that name. It's now trade name. The uh, University of uh, the Crop Improvement Association here in Minnesota does all of the uh, characterization of the grain to make sure that it meets uh, the, the requirements for that trade name. Thank you. Any other questions from folks? Uh, feel free to continue to add questions. Okay, one, other, one, one other is are the leaves edible? Uh, uh, the other part that I didn't mention is that it certainly is edible for livestock. You know, that's the other component. So it's, there's a big program at the University of Minnesota Morris where um, Kernza is being incorporated into the organic uh, milk production system. So it can be uh, harvested for grain and biomass that can be fed, but it can also be grazed in the fall and in the spring. Oh, good, thanks for catching that. Well, thank you very much, Don, for this good review, and we know it's only uh, part of the story, but it's a really exciting and inspiring story, and we appreciate you sharing it today. Well, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Yes. Now I will... Uh, Pass the little presenter ball over to Molly and Darren. And you can go ahead and share your screen and we'll get Darren's presentation up. Okay, should be coming up momentarily. There we go. So, uh, so Darren is a, as it says, a district 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 technician with the Crow Wing Soil and Water Conservation District and has been a real key uh, reason for this project happening and both in the idea stage and in implementation. We're really glad to join you or to have you join us today, Darren, and I'll turn it over to you now. Uh, thanks a lot, Linda, um, and also thanks a lot, Donald. That was really informative. I, I really appreciated that and, and I learned a lot. That was a great presentation. So yeah, I wanted to talk to you guys about uh, um, how we use your funds from the RCP, and we really appreciate it. We had a, a, an issue up here. We're trying to stabilize water quality on some of our larger lakes, and we had one in particular that we found some issues on, and I just wanted to show you the story of what we have and uh, what we're doing. So uh, initially, um, we, we I started my job in 2011, and in 2012, my supervisor asked me to take a look at some lakes, larger lakes in our county, just to see if there were some things that we could do to help them. Um, the one that kept popping up was Big Trout Lake um, in the northern part of the county. In 2008, there was a large lake assessment done by uh, Crow Wing County. Um, they targeted the lakes in the county to see which ones had some needs, and, and Trout Lake showed up. And we'll talk more about that in, in a little bit. In 2012, they did some impervious surface cover mapping for that particular lake, and that kind of um, showed some red, red areas that we needed to target. And with that, I was able to find some issues. Um, in 2013, they updated their water plan and included the large lake assessment and the impervious service cover into the water plan, and that helped us to focus our priorities on the lake. At the same time, um, that was about the time that we decided to try to look for funding so we could um, try to figure out ways to handle the issues that we found on this lake. 
In 2014, the DNR and the MPCA jumped in and, and they did some uh, lake sensitive, sensitivity reports on uh, Crow Wing County lakes and also some other counties outside. And in those studies, we found that Trout Lake had some issues. And lastly, uh, there was a specific report written by Pete Jacobson's with the DNR. They deemed that Trout Lake was one of the top five fisheries in the state and they wanted to really preserve it. And so the point of this, this slide is to let you know that there was a lot of people interested in trying to do something with Trout Lake and that's why we were really focused on trying to help it out. And so like I said, these were specific to Trout Lake, the top ones, and then the bottom ones were uh, the countywide with the water plan. So uh, we talked initially about the county focused on their priorities and they, um, they targeted the top lakes in the county. There's 16 large lakes in Crowing County. Um, the reason why they went after those was because they knew they would have water quality data on these lakes. Um, also these lakes have lake associations and so that's really vital for us because if there's a lake association, there is a need, there's people that are rallying around a cause and they're willing to, to put some sweat equity into these to try to improve their water quality. And then lastly, um, these large lakes were going to be put into the water plan and, and for our sake, anything that's in the water plan is a, is a tool that we can use to try to get funding to try to improve the issues that we find. And so uh, there were 16 lakes, like I said, and, and Big Trout Lake was one of them. And uh, these lakes, there was a lot of extensive screening on them and uh, assessments of the watersheds that were put into the water plan and some other reports and we were able to use that. And through that screening, we found out that there were six lakes that had a declining trend and of those, Big Trout was one of them. Um, there was one that didn't have enough data. There was five that had improving water quality, which was great to see. And then there was four that were stable. But we were focusing on the ones that declining trends. We wanted to do what we could. And, and once again, Trout Lake showed up. So here is actually Trout Lake, the, one, the lake that we were focusing on. You can see since 1992, our, our water quality has been declining up to 10 feet using Secchi disc. So we knew there was an issue. We knew there was something that we had to try to come up with to, to slow this down if we could. And so we also talked about in the Crowing County water plan, they had uh, done the impervious surface um, for the lake. And, and you were looking at the lake right now. And the different colors are basically uh, lake lots, uh, residential lake lots, and um, determining which ones of those were over the 25% impervious. And you can see there's a few of them. There's a lot of small lake lots. Some of these are actually maybe 50 foot frontage, up, some of them up to 100 foot. You can see the larger ones, they usually were under the 25% impervious, but the smaller ones, that's where some of the issues were at. There was just too many structures, and with that results in a lot of flow um, that have pollutants um, and nit nutrients flowing into the lake. Um, I want to see, I'm moving my arrow and I hopefully you can see it, but there was one in particular that we noticed right on Crow Wing, uh, County Road 66, and there was a big red area, and that's kind of what we were wondering about. That was um, kind of public land, and we thought maybe we could convince some of the public entities to help us focus on that need. And so uh, the Crowing County actually took all this information, not only what we saw here initially in uh, Big Trout, but all the lakes, they did this for all the watersheds and they came up with this, this um, map that kind of shows the risk classifications in the county. And so um, in this case, well, I should quickly let me go over what each one stands for. So the vigilance, the green, it just represents a really healthy watershed and uh, no lakes with uh, downward trends. They're very stable and they're doing a great job. A lot of times we see a lot of forested areas and, and lakes with uh, fewer residents on them. Um, in this case, the lighter green, the protection, those are lakes that they're in good shape. You know, they're, they're stable, maybe a slight trend. There's, uh, you know, not over a population and they're stable. And so they're doing, you know, there may be some little instances where some corrections could be or management techniques could be um, used to try to bring it up to a vigilance, but they're, they're in good shape. And then the, the yellow is the enhanced protection. And this is where the county really wants to focus its time. And, and we are focusing ours as well because uh, we find that the lands, the waters are in fair condition, but uh, it's a great opportunity for us to use um, a little bit of uh, sweat equity and, and some projects, best management practice installed on these lands and maybe even easements and other tools, we'll mention those later, that can bring this back up to a, a better level, the protection. The last one is the, the, the enhance, and unfortunately those are lands that are in really poor condition, uh, overdeveloped. Uh, you could see some of our larger cities, Crosby, Deerwood, Deer, uh, Brainerd are all in those areas. It's just a, a huge amount of development 
which uh, in turn um, kind of degrades water quality. And so there are BMPs and things like that that we can do to try to stabilize those, but those are watersheds that are in a really tough situation and it'll take quite a, fit of, quite a bit of taxpayer dollars to try to turn those. Granted, we're not giving up and we're gonna continue to work on those, but uh, we know that the, the enhanced protection ones are ones where a small amount of money can bring them up to a higher level of protection. And so I circled the area here where Trout Lake is at. And you, you can see that's in the enhanced protection area. And uh, I've got some numbers here to show that uh, it won't take a whole lot to help bring this, this watershed back, but uh, it's something we definitely want to uh, put some time into. And so uh, Pete Jacobson with the DNR fishery biologist uh, wrote a report specifically on a lake trout, um, realizing that it's a great lake because it does hold tulipy, uh, Cisco, some people have heard it, and it has a great lake trout population. It's one of the few lakes in the state that actually has a, a, a lake trout population. And so it's something the fisheries of the DNR really wanted to protect. So I, on, on the left, it's kind of a confusing slide. I wanted to go over a few things. So here's the lake, of course, and this is the watershed north of it. And, uh, and this first uh, gauge, you can see that it's talking about water infrastructure. And so that says that, the, you know, it's about an average or a little below average level of structures on the water. You saw in that previous map, there's a lot of residents that are built right along the lake, and that's something that you know we're working, trying to encourage them to do do better uh, BMP practices along the shoreline. But that's something we can't really change, and there'll always be homes there. If you looked at the next one, the disturbed land cover, it's in a really good trend. Um, there's a lot of forested parcels, it's heavily forested. Uh, the the dark green is is public lands, and so Crow Wing County does a great job of managing its forest, to con and they manage it specifically for water quality. And so we feel like those protected lands are in a good state. Uh, the lighter green are lands that are uh, potential to protect, and we've been working uh, extensively with this watershed, trying to convince those landowners to put that property into a conservation easement. We've had good success. And so with that, uh, the conservation e easement, once the landowner agrees to it, is saying that they uh, agree to not develop the parcel anymore, meaning that we'll be able to continue to manage the, the, those lands for water quality and for habitat as opposed to for development. And so that's a, a great way that we've been actually able to uh, you know, continue to protect those lands. So the next one is the one that we really focused on, the water quality uh, trend. You can see, we talked about it earlier, it's declining. We were down 10 feet in, since 1992. But that is the one area that we can work with. And I think just a little bit of improvement on that, if you look on the bottom, the enhanced protect, we're right on the edge. We're right on the enhanced protect and we're close to the green level. If we do a little bit of improvement with water quality, we can bring that watershed into more of a protection, a more of a, a, a stable water quality. And so that's kind of our goal is to work with that declining water trend to try to improve that, uh, that watershed. The very bottom, you can see there's a table here, and this is what we call our implementation toolbox. And those are just, uh, there's eight different ways that our office, the SWCD, can help landowners um, to improve their property that would benefit water quality. And that goes from the easiest, the less, the lower cost, um, easy to implement is just information. Giving them fact sheets on the importance of uh, stabilizing the shoreline, giving them fact sheets on the importance of managing the forest, um, the importance of not using fertilizer. All the way up until feed title acquisition. Now we can assist landowners in finding uh, federal and state and local entities that would be willing to purchase their land and keep it into you know, protected la um, land. And so you can see all the way up there, we've got uh, you know, categories that'll improve the land, some that'll manage it, and some acquire it. And so we're working you know, uh, with easements, number six, um, also enrolling uh, lands into uh, programs to help uh, stabilize the forest with a Sustainable Forest Incentive Act, with a 2C, which is the tax reduction, um, as long as they keep it in, in a healthy land, and even CRP with the feds. Number four is something we've been doing a lot, uh, buffers and septic system improvements and, and wetlands. And so that's, that's kind of the, uh, the BMP area. And then number three, we offer grants to help them do these BMPs. And that's kind of where we're at right now with the projects that we're looking to do. We're doing a lot of these smaller projects on Trout Lake, and we're also using these ideas and, and practices to, use, you know, to do the bigger project that we're about to mention here. 
So lastly, I wanted, well, I wanted to mention the importance of Trout Lake. Um, it is extremely sensitive to phosphorus. We've noticed that, and there's a study coming up, I'll show you, by, Pete, uh, um, by Paul Radomsky. Uh, shows that Trout Lake is really sensitive to phosphorus. But the importance to this lake is it is a very cold, deep water refuge lake for Trout Lake and Tulabee. And so it's a lake that we really need to protect. Um, and so both of these uh, fish really require cold, deep water, and, um, and they're kind of sensitive as well to phosphorus. And so in order to keep these two fish around, we have to do a good job of try to manage the phosphorus entering that lake. So I was talking about uh, Paul Jacobson's sensitive lake study. And in this table, it's kind of confusing. The bottom line is all the lakes in the Pine River watershed. We were doing the RAPS, the Pine River watershed assessments, and he, he was doing a study to see which one of these lakes was really sensitive to phosphorus. The, the highest one is Pelican Lake, which is an extremely clean lake, um, low vegetation, and so we, that's the number one. But if you look, the second one is Big Trout. And so what this table is basically saying is this trout is, is or excuse me, this lake is extremely sensitive to any amount of phosphorus that would enter it. It would quickly decrease the water quality. And so with that being said, we knew we had to find ways to slow down that phosphorus. And this table here basically shows the same thing. It, that lake with a little amount of phosphorus can quickly move that, um, that gauge from being green uh, protected all the way to, you know, into the yellow and beyond into the red where it's, it's, it's got serious issues. So now we want to come to the actual project and I'm glad you guys let me explain that to you real quick. Um, so the bottom picture is what we found. This is the actual culvert that has a direct flow of quite a bit of storm water into Trout Lake. Matter of fact, if you look below, it's 121 acres is flowing through the, of, of, of water is draining through that culvert. It's about an 18 inch culvert. Um, it, it, the water is coming from two kind of sources. One, there's a curb and gutter along Highway 66. And so we've got vehicles that are traveling. It's, an, it's a larger highway, a lot of vehicles on there, and they're all depositing you know, their materials off the cars so that are going straight from the road to the culvert into the lake. Secondly, there's a huge dis, uh, ditch system along uh, to the northern part of that culvert. Um, I didn't put the topography on here, but basically from County Road 1, which is the top road, all the way down to where the culvert is at in here, it's, it's a downward flow. And so any rain that occurs up in here is flowing along this ditch and making it down here. And you can see we've got some lower, uh, not much uh, trees, uh, kind of a grassy area. Matter of fact, there is livestock out there. And so that is one larger issue of we're getting the flow off of this compacted area, as well as there's a development, the landowners attempting to build another lake here, which is um, an issue that we're finding with sediment flowing off of that into the road. And so we've got 121 acres of area that is flowing in the Trout Lake and along that bringing the phosphorus. So doing some studies, we found out that uh, on any given year, we're getting about 50 tons of sediment, which is equal to about three dump trucks of sand. And with that, as you know, uh, phosphorus is tied to sediment. We have about 50 pounds of phosphorus entering the lake just in this one culvert every year. And so we realized, well, this is something that if we can tackle, we can really turn the trend quickly. So at this time, we realized, hey, we need some help. And that's why we turned to your group. And we're really grateful for it. Um, through the funding we see for you guys, we, we kind of realized that we needed some assistance on not only the dollars to try to get something done, but the you know, information that the U of M has. And so we brought in uh, Dr. Uh, or Professor Joel Bangder uh, from the Department of Bioproducts and Biosystem Engineering, and he brought students with him to kind of analyze what he saw on the ground and give us some ideas of what they thought. Uh, the grant dollars were used to, you know, pay them, but also pay our engineer to come up with a plan. And lastly, we were able to uh, use the dollars to bring all the entities. And if you look on the bottom, you can see all the icons of all the entities that we had to bring together, all the players. Um, unfortunately, we have issues where they don't want to play well together. And so we had to come together and talk to them about the issue and see which one would step up and, and help out. And, uh, and actually, it turned out really well. We've got a good clip of collaboration with these groups. And we're excited that uh, with these groups, we're going to get this project done. So. Uh, Quick synapses of what we did. Um, like I mentioned before, we brought in Dr. Joel Magner and his students, and those students got on the ground. They did some great work um, analyzing the situation, determining 
what would fit. I mean, it's a really tight spot, and as you can saw, 121 acres of water. It's a lot of water in a small area that we have to try to manage. The students worked with our engineer. The engineer that we have is with the Joint Powers Board, and those four students along with our engineer came up with the plan um, that we could use. Once we got the plan, it was approved by my board, by the Minnesota Department of Transportation, the Crow Wing County, and the City of Manhattan Beach. They all accepted the plan. Once we got that plan, then we did the next big step, and that's that we submitted to Bowser for the Clean Water Land and Legacy Grant. And fortunately enough, we were awarded 300000 to try to tackle this issue. And so uh, there is a 25% match required, but we think we can handle that. But the, the, the thing that needs to be said again is if it had not been for the funding that we got from RSDP, we would not have come up with the plan. And I'll show you a photo of it. It's above my head. But we needed this plan, and we were able to use this plan to get the awards, the funding from Clean Water to get this done. And that's why we're really appreciative. And so um, the plan itself, you know, what we needed to do is we needed to improve the stormwater. And um, it's such a small area, it's a large amount of water flowing in there, but we needed to tackle that first inch of rain event. And as you probably know, most of the sediment is carried to lakes and, and drainages in the first inch. After that, it's pretty much flushed all the bad stuff off, and so the rest of the water can just continue to flow. And so we had to focus on that first inch. Um, the students from the University of Minnesota came up with, with uh, something that we hadn't seen before. I'm not sure where they found it, but we're grateful they found it. It's called a downstream defender. And with these downstream defenders, and I'll show you more about them in a little bit, I think these things are going to help us tackle this amount of water. Um, we anticipate that using these downstream defenders and the design that they came up with, we're going to be able to reduce about 40 tons of sediment and 40 pounds of phosphorus. Now, I know that's not all of it. But hey, nothing's perfect. We're, we're excited for this. I think this is going to be uh, make a big difference. So here's kind of a crazy design picture of the area. Uh, some of the things that you want to see is, um, so we talked about this is facing north. There's a lot of slope, a lot of water flowing down the ditch. And we've got three major pipe outlets, one, two, and the third picture doesn't show up, but that's up here, these green dots. And so that, that's where the water is flowing right into the, into the pipe. We also have the curb and gutter. The curb and gutter is the red lines, and they're pretty long and extensive. And so those are flowing into manhole covers that are also going in a pipe. So we've got direct flow in the ditch and on the road that's going right into this, this outlet, the pipe outlet. And you can see there's quite a bit of flow. And so our plan is to uh, redirect these pipes so that they flow through these three uh, downstream defenders. And in doing so, we're going to be able to pull out a lot of the uh, sediments and phosphorus. And so I want to talk to you about how that would work. Well, before that even, here is the design that we came up with the engineer plan. It looks really confusing. It just means money and a lot of work. I don't know exactly what it all stands for, but we're grateful because this thing told us, you know, said a lot of words for us. You know, a picture's worth a thousand words. There's more than a thousand words in this diagram. But that's what we paid, you guys paid the money for and we were able to get. And this is uh, the design that we're going to be able to use to implement. Hopefully we got a contractor who can read this because I can't. Here's the downstream defender and how it works. And this is an amazing piece of equipment. We're excited that we're going to be able to use it. Not many people in the state have used it yet. Like I said, it's new, but I think it's an amazing piece. And so first, the pollutants run into the pipe. Um, then the water is swirling around this baffle. And while it's swirling, the water is picking up speed. Uh, and the sediment is dropping out. And so as the water picks up speed, it flows out the exit. Meanwhile, the sediment is dropping into the bottom of this, of this uh, downstream defender. What's the nice thing about it is it's designed so that we can actually pull the sediment out of the top. It's got a manhole cover. So this unit will be underground except for the manhole cover. Um, and so they'll be able to go in there with a vacuum truck and, and vacuum all the sediment up, right? You know, putting the hose right down the center. There's a tube here, this blue tube right down and sucking up the sediment. So uh, there's so much water we realized and we calculated we need three of these. And unfortunately, they're going to have to be maintained. And that's one of the issues we're stumbling upon right now is the cost of that. So maintenance for this thing, it's, it's about $250 per defender. We, knew, we know we need three of them, so we're looking at about $750. $70, now, that doesn't sound like a whole lot of money, but the issue is the city of Manhattan Beach is the one that would have to do it. Uh, the city of Manhattan Beach is a really small city, extremely small. They basically have one person on staff, and that's a half-time employee. They have a mayor who just shows up, you know, when they need to. So what, they don't have staff to do this, and so they're going to have to, you know, bring somebody in. There's basically one person in the county that can come up and do it, and this is their cost they're going to charge. 
Um, this actually is, is a substantial amount of money for the city of Manhattan Beach's budget. And so we have asked other players that they would be willing to help out with the maintenance requirements. Our grant that we got, the 300000 is going to cover the first year for the first three years of the maintenance. But it's from that point on that, you know, these things are going to continually have to be maintained because we know there's going to be a lot of sediment in them. And so we're working with the city of Manhattan Beach to try to get an agreement where they're willing to do this for us. Um, the funding is the issue, and uh, fortunately enough, uh, WAPOA, Whitefish Area Property Owners Association, that's the, that lower icon, they're the lake association for not only whitefish but big trout, but many lakes up there. They have generously said that they would financially help the city of Manhattan Beach in, in paying for the maintenance of this, and so we're really grateful. Um, we're still working on that formalized maintenance plan with them. Once we get a formalized, our plan is to try to get that signed into a, like a, um, an agreement, a permanent agreement. Um, once we get an agreement, then we're going to finalize the plan. You saw the plan earlier. There's still some details to work out. You know, it's a really small area. We have utilities to worry about. We have logistics to worry about. Um, that road is really busy, and unfortunately, to put this in, we're going to have to uh, stop traffic for a while. And so we want to do it early spring before traffic gets crazy up there. The second issue is they're going to have to cut power. So the local residents that are up there are going to lose power for a little bit. They're going to use, lose utilities. You know, uh, I think there's actually a gas line going through there, also the sewer lines. And so there are logistics like that that we have to deal with. And then lastly, we need to put it out for bid and see if we can find a contractor that will accept the amount of money that we got through the grants. But once again, the plan is to get this installed by 2017, um, by the spring, early before the, the people come up and, you know, and start recreating. And uh, we think that once implemented, we're going to right away see a turnaround for a stable and improved water quality in the lake. So it was quick, it was short, but uh, we appreciate uh, your guys' um, support and getting this done. We're really excited. These are just a couple of photos of the actual lake. Um, I didn't take the pictures of the water, I found other things to take a picture of, but it's, if you ever get a chance, come on up. It's a beautiful lake, and uh, we think that what we're going to do is make it uh, continue to stay its course and be a great lake for the future. Oh, thank you, Darren. That was a, a lot of information and really well presented. Thank you. We do have one question for you already, um, and if others have questions, please add them to the chat box. Um, Karen asks, uh, first she says, this is fascinating, and, oops, I'm sorry. There's another question ahead of that, I think. She was curious about how the, uh, how willing people are to, how attitudes have changed from owners over the years, what they're willing to do, um, which projects or practices they're, you're having more challenge allowing them to, or getting them to adopt. So a little bit about how landowners are responding to the practices. Sure, we've had a, a moderate success up there. Um, what's nice is we notice if we can convince one or two landowners on a specific lake to do a project and then throw a sign up after that project is completed, we get a lot of calls in our office. Um, we really focus on shoreline buffers. We try to get up to 25 foot wide. That's kind of difficult sometimes. Landowners don't really want to see that much going to you know, native vegetation, but that's what we strive for. But once we get it planted, it's amazing how they change from really tentative, not want to see it happen to, wow, it's beautiful, we love it. Because mm -hmm. when we plant these natives, we try to find flowers that are, going to, that are going to bloom from spring to fall. You know, really attractive. We try to meet the landowner's needs. Some of them do not want any large shrubs or trees in the lake because they enjoy their view of the lake. And so we stick to lower plants and shrubs. Other ones are willing to let us put, like, for instance, uh, river birch, paper birch, um, aspen, those kind of trees, in, in, if they really are open to it, we try to put pines, red and white pine on there. Um, but we're always trying to find something that meets landowners' need and that they're excited for. I think the key that we found is um, when I do these projects, and a lot of them I actually do them with my own crew, we encourage the landowner to come out there with us because if they're getting their hands dirty beside us, we know that when we leave, they're going to continue to do their best to keep it there. Um, they really take ownership, and that is key. And so we've had good success with landowners that have taken ownership and then told their neighbors. Um, people don't know me from blue, so if the neighbor says it's a great project, we really love it, then it spreads, and then we get phone calls. And so we've got um, – we actually – I was fortunate also, at the same time I found this issue, 
there's two camps that are on Trout Lake, and both of them had some minor issues, and we went to both uh, camps, and they both agreed to let us work. And so we did some larger projects on both camps and put signs up. And so not only did the people that are riding their boats and the residents of the lake, but also the kids that are attending these camps saw the signs and realized the importance of what we were doing, and, and that word is spreading as well. And so, you know, we spend little dollars, you know, in the amount that, that we have available on implementing them, but we see not only the improved project on the land, but we see that it's educating and it's spreading. And so, um, like I said, buffers are a big one. We do a few rain gardens if we can up higher up, and that's, you know, that that's a little bit harder to spread because it's not as easy to see from the road or from the lake. Um, if we can get rain gardens that are visible, I think people are interested in it. And, and fortunately enough, the city of Manhattan Beach just did a rain garden this year, and so we think that's going to encourage people to do those as well. And so it's all about uh, people seeing them and visually appreciate them and then and spreading the word. And so we're get, it's becoming more and more popular, and, and we're grateful for that. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, those are some really wise ways of approaching it with getting kids involved and getting landowners out there to help with the plantings. A little bit like a school garden where the kids eat the vegetables that they've grown. So <laughs> that uh, engagement works at lots of lots of levels. Well, and that last photo you saw was a butterfly on one of our pollinators, and that's something we're pushing hard. You know, we're losing our pollinators. Right. And so yeah. we always let landowners know what we're putting in the ground is going to be beneficial to butterflies and bees and, and, and birds and hummingbirds that, you know, look for those pollinator species. Excellent. Thank you both uh, to Don and to Darren for really great presentations today. Thank you all for joining us for the uh, for these presentations. I hope you'll find ways to connect with both uh, Don and with Molly and Darren. Uh, to learn more and to see how this might be applied in other places. I'm, uh, I'm very curious to see how these downstream defenders uh, perform. So I'll be, I'll be checking back after that is in place. Uh, thanks again to presenters. Really appreciate your, your time today. And have a lovely afternoon. The sun is shining up north. I hope it is across the state. Enjoy the beautiful fall day.